Hello, Heartland. Good to be with you this week. I'm so glad you've decided to join our online service this weekend. Of course, as you heard earlier, it is a refuge takeover service. And I hope you enjoy connecting with one of our student-led worship teams that leads our weekly youth service. At Refuge this fall, we have also started a new series based in the book of Ephesians. So let's continue our study together as a church. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Our focus is going to be on verses 4 to 6. However, I'm going to read verses 1 to 6 so that we can hear it all flow together as one chunk. Before I do that, I just wanted to mention a couple things about how the Bible is put together. In your Bible, you have two sections, Old Testament and New Testament. Between the two sections, you have 66 individual books, 39 old and 29 new. The New Testament was written in a language called Koine Greek. Koine means, in Greek, common or shared. You see, it was the plain spoken language of the day. It was the language that would have been most understood by most people. It was the language from the international traveler to the commoner to children. So the New Testament was written in a plain, understandable language. But it was also written by very regular, everyday folks who had a variety of backgrounds. Some would have had more education. Some would have had very little education. But all of them were led by the Holy Spirit to write down what is in your Bible. Now, not only that, a good chunk of the New Testament is letters to the churches. Ephesians is one of those letters. These letters would have been received by church leaders and read to the church congregation. These were not necessarily scholars or highly educated people. They were everyday people who had been changed or charged in their local cities to lead the church and take the instruction that was sent to them. In this case, Paul to the church in Ephesus. Now, sometimes we come to places in the Bible that have big words, and these words can cause us to maybe just skip past them in some cases, or maybe we choose to delve in deep and go an extra layer of study to help us understand them. Sometimes these words cause tension because they have different meanings to different people. Our passage today has one of these words. While I'm all for the deeper study of God's word, the Bible, I'm also all for being able to take a spiritual truth and unpack it in understandable language. In fact, I preach to youth each week, so I have 15 minutes max to unpack the deepest of theological truths in an understandable and relatable way before their attention span completely dissipates. There's our challenge today. Let's see if we can walk away with a better understanding of this set of verses in 15 to let's say 20-ish minutes, so that we can grow in our ability today to speak to others about Jesus' truth. Let's start the timer. And let's read from Ephesians 1. So I'm going to read verses 1 to 6. You can follow along wherever you're watching from. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That was verses 1 to 3. Now here's our passage. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Did you catch the word out of our verses? Yeah, you got it. It's, it is predestined, or as you may have heard it referred to, predestination. While it is just one word picked out of our verses in this passage, it is a major word that is best understood by the verses surrounding it, and the verses surrounding it are best understood by understanding it. Are you with me? So what does it mean, this word predestination? Well, predestination in the divine sense means that God has a purpose that is determined long before it is brought to a reality. It implies that God is infinitely capable of planning 
and then bringing about what he has planned. And scripture speaks of him as doing this. God's purpose is one of love and grace. Above all, because in love, he predestined what should come to pass in his plan to save and to restore sinful humanity through his son, Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.26 speaks of this purpose as the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now is disclosed. It really has everything to do with this. Who's picking who? Have you ever felt left out? Have you ever felt maybe alone in the world? I think there's a lot of times when we do feel alone. Alone and disconnected from the people around us. But we can also feel really disconnected from God. We can also feel a sense of unwantedness from people around us. But again, also from God. I think when it comes to God, sometimes we can feel the tension that somewhere in the spiritual realm, somewhere out there, there's a cosmic team picking that is going on. God gets first pick, the devil gets every second pick, and each is picking their team, completely removing humanity from the equation. Some of us have experienced the, the playground experience where your fingers are crossed and you're hoping not to be picked last. Is this similar? Are we fingers crossed? Please let it be that God picks me and not the devil. Is this what is described in the Bible? Who is picking who here? Well, guess what? God has picked you. God has chosen us. We didn't choose him. God has a plan and he has pursued you. He is always pursuing all of us. He sees all of us no matter where we are or where we are at. As 1 Peter 3.9 reminds us, he is not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. Let that soak in for a moment. I'm not sure what your belief in God is or even a higher power, but for a moment, let's just say there is one true God who has created all things, the entire universe, and that God wants to adopt you into his family to lavish you with an inheritance of every spiritual blessing. Would that be something you would want to be part of? In God's good purpose for us individually or as part of the people of God, which is the church as we're meeting, it is by God's initiative that he chooses us and thus is a work of grace, something that we could never initiate or even deserve. God knows the brokenness that we live in. God knew the damage that has been done to his creation, to us, to humanity. We call this damage sin. And this damage is irreparable without the extreme intervention of God. Go in your Bibles for a moment with me to Romans 3, 10 to 11. We're going to travel around to a number of verses here and just, just kind of listen through these as I read them to you. Uh, Romans 3, 10 to 11 says, As it is, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. Okay, now jump over to Isaiah 53, uh, verse 6. It says, and this might be a familiar one to you, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, now jump back with me to our passage, Ephesians 1. But instead of verses 4 to 6, we're just going to jump down to verses 11 to 12 for a moment, where it says, In him, Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. Okay, and then one more. Still in Ephesians, we'll just jump over to chapter 2 for a moment, verses 8 to 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of the works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, 
the major emphasis that we find in the Bible is this. God is on the prowl. He is pursuing us. In Ephesians 1, we see the focus on God's activity in planning and choosing people in Christ. In other words, the existence of the people of God, us, the church, can be explained only on the basis of God's character, plan, and action. Not on some quality in the people who are chosen. The initiative is always God's based on his grace. Salvation is not some accident or afterthought on the part of God. His purpose was always to draw humanity to himself. There are many examples in scripture that we see this on an individual level that has huge effects on the masses. From the call of Abraham all the way through the call of Paul. Abraham was likely an idol worshiper before God called him to be the father of his people. Paul was traveling the countryside, destroying the church before he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and got called to be the major builder of the church. It is always God taking the first step towards us. The emphasis in Ephesians 1.5 that we see here on adoption shows that purpose is relational. God, for no other reason other than he is a loving God, chose to adopt people into his family through Jesus Christ. He chose to adopt you. He chose to adopt me. It is done this way because as Ephesians 2 that we just read told us, so that no one can boast. All the glory for salvation, for new life found in Jesus, all the spiritual blessings we receive, our eternal inheritance, all of that, is to be credited to God, not to us, not to humanity. There is no entitlement in grace. It is a gift graciously given, undeserved. You know, when it comes to the topic of predestination, there are some strong opinions that are present. And in regard to these strong opinions, I have a simple caution for all of us. It's this. Don't be a know-it-all. Regarding predestination, there are two camps that folks generally land in. Camp number one, the Calvinists. They say that God has irresistibly reeled and drew you to himself, that he has pre-chosen his people for his family. Now, a major issue that they run into is if God pre-chooses who goes to heaven and is in his family, then he pre-chooses hell for others by default. Their major emphasis is on God's sovereignty. Now, the camp uh, number two is the Arminians. Now, with them, you have to make a choice. God tapped you on the shoulder, but he is tapping everyone on the shoulder. But if you need to check, but you need to check the box of whether you are in for the family of God or not in. Now, a major issue they run into is if you can check the box, then Can you uncheck the box? Their major emphasis is on free will for humanity and God's fairness. So how does sovereignty and free will work itself out? I don't know. That's the thing. We don't fully know. And you are probably more comfortable in one camp or the other. And I certainly know which camp I lean more towards. But there's a threat of great tragedy when I, we, move from what it, what it teaches me to what I don't know so that I can argue about it. I look at it this way. If I lived in a basement suite, and that is the only reality of living I knew, if I didn't even know there was more to the house upstairs, I could only see side to side and not up and down, it would be a very two-dimensional way of viewing things. If I moved upstairs, though, and all of a sudden that opened up to me, I would realize that my existence also had depth to it as I moved into a three-dimensional way of viewing. But what if I also discovered there is a whole outside world? What? That would be mind-blowing as I enter a four-dimensional way of viewing things, bigger than I ever imagined, more to it than I ever could have fathomed. This is where God exists. He stands outside of time. God sees all, knows all, and he has power over all. 
right now on Earth, we are living three-dimensionally, and we don't have the full understanding of a four-dimensional world that not only includes a physical realm, but also a spiritual realm. We get glimpses into the spiritual realm, but it won't be until we are partaking in our eternal spiritual inheritance that we have full understanding of all that is going on around us. And I think that when we get to that point, we're going to probably look back and say often, how did I not get that? There's an interesting verse that emphasizes this in uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29, actually. It says, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. I should be considering what teaches me to live in obedience to the glory and fame of my Lord Jesus. The Bible doesn't need our help. I shouldn't be focusing on what teaches me to divide from other Christians and argue about things I do not fully understand anyway. There is nothing more frustrating than an arrogant Christian. An arrogant Christian stands in complete opposition to God choosing us through his son, Jesus. And they stand in complete opposition the way God has asked us to live and share his son, Jesus, with others. The Bible is clear, and it's clear in this. God has a plan, and that plan will not be thwarted. We read earlier in Ephesians 1.11, and I'll just remind you what that verse says here. It says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Paul would like to remind the church that this is an us thing or a we issue. We, God's people, the church, are destined for an inheritance in Jesus. This is God's plan today, just like it has always been God's plan. We have destination certainty. We are predestined to a certain destiny in Jesus. Feel free this week as you are reading the Bible uh, in your own quiet time to read through the whole chapter of Romans 8. But for today, I just want to read you a few verses uh, to get this uh, in your head as we continue forward. Uh, So Romans 8 uh, verse 31, and we're going to read to 35. It says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Let me put it this way. I'm sure most of you have been on an airplane, maybe not lately, but at some point in your life. When you get on an airplane, you sit down, You settle in, you buckle your seatbelt, and then the door closes, right? And and you're in. You have gotten on board with the destination of the plane. You have chosen to follow the captain where he takes you. You are predestined to go where the plane goes. In Christ, we have gotten on his plane. He is predestined for us an eternity of inheritance. We know the destination. It has been described throughout the Bible, and nothing, nothing can separate us from that position in Christ. Why is this significant, though? Well, on a day when uncertainty surrounds us in our daily lives, we have certainty in our position with Jesus and our destination with Jesus. What's going to conquer us when we know this truth? Yes, we're going to face some turbulence along the way, some trouble, some distress, some persecution, famine, danger, death, nakedness, pandemic perhaps. What are you facing today? In Christ, we know our destination, and we know that today's troubles and tomorrow's worries are merely blips on the way. 
And Jesus has promised to walk with us hand in hand through these troubles and worries, to give us what we need to face every day. It won't be easy by any stretch. The Bible never promises it will be. But God does promise in the Bible, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Lastly, let me just close with, what else should we know? Well, the cause of being predestined in Christ is God. But what is the purpose? The purpose is that we live holy and blameless before God. Our position in Christ leaves us holy and blameless because the work of Christ, which is about to be described in verses 7 to 11. Pastor Barry gave a summary last week of what is ahead in chapter 1, and Pastor Greg will start to unpack it more next week. Our verses describe that we stand before God, before Him, in love. It was out of love that God chose us and brought us into the blessing that leaves us holy and blameless in Christ. Love is the sphere that emerges from God's act of choosing. And it is not a mere emotional response, but a moving towards another with his or her best interest in mind. The point of being a child of God is to reflect his character and attributes to everyone, doing this through the spirit that he gives us. The position we have is a result of love, and the way we are to respond is rooted in our loving. As 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. Now, these verses that we've been looking at here, they may sound daunting, but know this. They are not promoting perfectionism, but they are calling for Christ followers to live lives of service to God. God in his word gives us simple truth to live by. In simple Koine Greek, written by simple humans. And our verses today may not seem that simple, but here it is, really boiled down. One, us being chosen by God is God's grace in action. Two, we are chosen by God in Christ Jesus for relationship with God. Three, while God chooses us, we people still have choice in choosing to receive God's grace to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we have a responsibility for our ongoing decisions and the consequences for those decisions when we choose to operate outside of God's guidelines, his Bible, for our lives. Number four, being chosen and receiving God's grace does demonstrate God's favor, which is all the spiritual blessings and an eternal inheritance but it is never to be treated as a sign of superiority. And lastly, number five, the ultimate goal of being chosen by God is the partnership we form with God to reveal his character to others. The truth is that salvation is entirely a work of God in which humans are totally involved. If God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, as Acts 17 tells us, we do not stand isolated from him in making a decision for him. God is the one who works in and through us, even as we choose him. Well, are you lonely today? Do you feel forgotten? Maybe God feels far away. Do the problems and uncertainty of today seem too heavy to face anymore? Let let me remind you, God acted first. He created us. He gave us all that we need in Christ. And he housed his spirit in us so that we can collaborate with him to live holy lives. Wherever you are watching or listening to this today, God picked you. And I pray you choose to receive this gift. Amen. Stop the clock. My video blog. Epic B roll. Take one. Good day. Top of the morning. Here we see Rob in his natural habitat. Fixing cables. Something's not right. We're at threat level midnight.
Oh, Rob's not doing a good enough job. Cole's there to help out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. let's, let's just go for it. And we'll see how awkward I can be. Woohoo! <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, you ready? Okay, yeah. Boom. Thanks, Pastor Wade. Can I just ask one more question? Like, my eyes look like I'm looking in the camera if I'm reading off there? They'd be remarkably astray. Like, should I be lower? No. So I'm like, okay. And then I'm ready. Thank <laughs> you.